Happy Saturday, everybody. Welcome back again to another edition of the Book Asylum Podcast. Man, we have so much fun doing these shows every week. Hopefully you guys are finding out cool stuff about these authors, going out, grabbing their stuff, reviewing, always review. Well, this week, myself, Richard Ryan Rose, Anthony Bad Wabbit Castro, Kristen Vincent, Bobby Jean Murphy, fresh off of St. Jude's Cruise, and my boy from Puerto Rico, Angel Ramon, we get to hang out this week with the one and only blue check totem, Tony Urban. What is up, my man? Thank you, Meatball. Thanks very much for having me. Dude, glad to have you on. Uh, obviously, uh, Dan, who we really wanted to be able to be here because he's he knows you, you know, big time. He's a fan fan. And we're here going to learn so that we can go become fan fans. And unfortunately, he is on call. Hopefully, he can pop in. We'll see and go from there. But, man, give us a little bit of background into – what made you decide to pick up the old pen, per se, and start writing? I've always loved writing since I was a kid. Um, I remember in third grade, I would write stories and ask to read them aloud in class. Uh, I just always loved writing any type of screenplays, books, short stories. Uh, probably in my senior year in high school, it really started to take it seriously. I started writing for a couple of magazines at that point in time. Uh, the school newspaper, of course, you know. Uh, and I started getting into screenwriting when I was, I guess, 19. Uh, I had a really low budget independent movie produced when I was 21. And I could make a career in the business, didn't pan out. Uh, I decided to start uh, photography business. And I did that for about eight years. I didn't write a word from 2002 to about 2012. And I got back into it through writing a travel log, actually. Uh, about horror movie locations and different things like that and kind of rekindled my love of writing so uh everything kind of snowballed from there i wrote my first novel in 2016 and kind of lost track of how many i've written since then but uh yeah. that's a good thing i was gonna say that's a good thing <laughs> yeah <laughs> well dude uh, it's amazing to me that someone could take such a long break and then all of a sudden it, it, it comes back, you know, like, Oh, I remember, I really liked doing this and you go back to doing it. Did, does it, did it kind of surprise you that the love came back and you just felt like I got to go get back to this? It really did. Yeah. Um, Cause my photography business was going really well at the time. I didn't, uh, I didn't need to write. Um, I kind of figured I'd be doing photography for the rest of my life. Never anticipated getting back into writing really even as a hobby level, a full-time profession. Uh, it was more just, Gig. Uh, it was more just for like the novelty of it when I started like, to travel. Like, I sent some photos I had taken to Chipper Publishing in uh, Ackland, PA, because they do a lot of nonfiction stuff. I sent some photos, like two sample chapters, and like a few weeks later, they're like, hey, write this book for us. And I was like, crap, I got to figure out how to write a book. <laughs> <laughs> when I said, later it came out. Yeah, it, I, I really don't feel like I missed much of anything by taking the time off kind of uh, allowed me to maybe mature a little bit and kind of, you know, find my voice a little bit more. Uh, but honestly, during all the years I didn't write, I never even thought about it. I never picked up a pen and thought, hey, I should do this on the side or I have a story idea. Uh, it was just totally at the back of my mind. And yeah, I took a, a long break and fortunately fell back into it. That's correct. Great. Correct me if if I heard if I heard you wrong, but I think you mentioned that you made a couple of low budget movies. How did you go about doing that? How did that all come about? Uh, basically, I mean, none of them are worth watching. Uh, I'll be honest about that. Uh, <laughs> I guess I did screenwriting. I wrote a movie called Poor White Trash, that starred uh, William Devane and Sean uh, Young, couple, like C level actors. I've heard uh, of that movie. I thought I had the world by the tail, 19 years old, 20 years old. I thought, man, this is really going to take off for me. Uh, I kept sending stuff around, sending stuff around. I'd get a few scripts options, but nothing ever came of it. I thought, if I want to really do anything with this, I'm going to have to do it myself. So I thought, I'm going to make a movie. I watched Tim Ritter's uh, Truth or Dare. And I thought, man, if, if, you know, if this movie can take off, I can do something that takes off. Now, I was very wrong. <laughs> I spent a couple of years making some movies that didn't do anything. I mean, we had a couple that got distribution, but uh, I had no idea what I was doing. I was I wasn't a kid that played around with video cameras. I never made little movies with my friends or anything like that. I thought I'd watch enough movies I could do it. 
uh, learned the hard way and a lot more to it than that. <laughs> but uh, I think when the movie's kind of like, like I said, we got, I made one called Cotton Tail. It was about a killer Easter bunny. They got picked up by Green Damage Films. I was thinking for distribution, but there's no money in it. And I was just racking up debt and racking up more debt and going further back. Wow. And that's when the photography thing took off. I never looked back. I think that's a big reason why I stopped writing. I was just so burned out on all these different projects I had in the works that fizzled out or just ended up costing me money. Yeah, right. So when photography took off for me, I really didn't even look back at it. Yeah. Totally understand yeah. that. Mm-hmm. And yeah, then before then, we move on, uh, Jack, before we, we got a couple of people watching, we got uh, me Edwards watching from the Witten on Dead group. He says, <laughs> I see a whole lot of dumb on my screen, but there are some <laughs> people on my screen as well. I won't say who is who. <laughs> and we also got Dungeon Dan watching us. Hey, Dungeon Dan. Yes, and, hello, and I- everyone, and especially Tony Urban. I am Dan. <laughs> The, yeah, nice posters in the background, Tony. Oh, thank you. <laughs> well, I guess since uh, you know Dan is noticing those, why don't you give us a quick breakdown? What do you have hanging behind you here? Uh, I have to look and see, actually. Uh, in the very background, we have uh, Night of the Demon, Creep Show, Evil Dead, uh, Night of the Living Dead, Reanimator, uh, Return of the Living Dead, Night of the Creeps, and Black Christmas. Nice. I go to a lot of autograph conventions, movie conventions, and that's all my my childhood heroes and all that stuff. Still, COVID put the end to it. So, So now, Um, what uh, since I you mentioned Creep Show, of all the bits in Creep Show, which one was your favorite? (laughs) I always got him. (laughs) <laughs> uh, I just love I love Stephen King's cameo performance in that. I know it's not the best segment of this in the uh, anthology, but I love hearing Stephen King say meteor shit. <laughs> <laughs> oh hell yeah! All right, come on guys, jump in. Throw some um, this man, let's I go. Because I have to get to it. At what point did you get invested and interested in the paranormal? I always have been. Uh, since I was a little kid. My mom was always into ghosts and stuff like that. Uh, we'd go to places locally that were supposedly haunted. You know, cemeteries where you're supposed to see a light in the bell tower at midnight on Halloween. We did all that stuff. So since I was probably seven or eight years old, I've been obsessed with everything about that. And have you had many uh, personal... Uh, paranormal experiences? Yeah, I wish I have, but I have not. I mean, I've gone to so many places that have been supposedly haunted. Uh, Moundsville Prison, Trans Allegheny Asylum. Oh, yeah. Not, but I haven't lucked out yet. Keep trying, man. Keep trying. <laughs> yeah, if you notice, it seems like some yeah. people, they just, they they draw it in and yeah. have all these experiences. Then there's people like you and like me. Nothing. We're talking crickets. That's yeah, because you scare them off, Jack. <laughs> <laughs> I am pretty intimidating, I have to admit. You know, I mean, there's some people that ride closer to the edge of the veil, you know, and they are able to see things easier. Um, I died when I was like four years old. I fell into a pool and I drowned to death for like two minutes. And the some psychic lady later on in life said that that's probably one of the reasons why I've been able to like be witness to crazy stuff, you know, because you know when people that have passed over just for a few minutes have like a thinner line there on the veil. So huh. I mean, who knows? But it's crazy. It's crazy. Yeah. Well, well then let's go ahead. I don't think I. So what? Oh, no, hello, Doc. For the, uh, hey, I I can't hear you guys, and I don't. Hmm. <laughs> oh, nope. can you hear us now? It sounds it like way up. You got us, Doc. Maybe that one. Nope. Hi, now I can hear everybody. Hey, Yay. Right. Hey. 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 Sorry, I'm we're, driving home. So I was, I was like, yeah, we're getting a heck of a view here, though. It's a pretty view. Yep, yes. it's pretty. Uh, so, 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 Tony, uh, how many books do you have out 
I mean, I, and everybody asks me that. I get. I never keep the running a running tab. Um, I'm gonna say probably around eighteen or so somewhere now. Oh, home. nice. Yo, can you tell us a little bit about your latest one? I'm kind of curious. Well, my latest, uh, the last couple books I've written have all been uh, paranormal uh, nonfiction books. Uh, we just came out with Paranormal Pennsylvania, which is about ghost sightings, cryptid sightings, UFO sightings in Pennsylvania. Um, oh, wow. In October. And before that was uh, Beware of the Woods, which is mostly like Bigfoot and cryptid sightings all across America. Um, yeah, see, Richard just got a chub. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a bit That's of a amazing. cryptid guy, so... <laughs> But yeah, those are all for so I've been writing a bunch of those. So I've done a lot of interviews, my experiences, um, going to different uh, paranormal conventions and stuff like that, hooking up with people and uh, getting their stories. Have you ever oh, had any awesome. experiences in the crypto no. arena? <laughs> the closest is like uh, Woodnock when I've been out in places where they've had like a lot of big push training. Um, I thought maybe I heard a call one time. Uh, I can't say for sure. Yeah, it could have been a coyote. But definitely didn't sound like anything I ever heard. Uh, but that's the clues I've come. No actual sighting. And these are based on true stories, these uh, these things you put in your books, right? A lot of them? Um, the paranormal books I write are all true stories, yeah. yeah Did you all- uh, personally interview these people? or you say that? Did you personally interview these people? And I mean, like, is there a lot of interviews and, and research goes into it? Yeah. Each one, um, the interviewing process is the longest part of it. And then kind of, you know, Condensing the interviews down into something readable. But yeah. uh <laughs> but yeah, I've interviewed, oh gosh, um over a hundred people over the last two or three years. Wow. Wow, no oh. doubt. Yeah. Holy smoke. That's a so lot of darn kind of people. Like a, you're kind of like an investigator journalist kind of book book writer. I like that. Yeah. What, all, what all cryptids have you interviewed witnesses for uh, i know there's bigfoot dog man of course there's a, a ton of them out there yeah bigfoot are the two most common bigfoot by far is the most common uh dog man sightings dog man or werewolf you know whichever i kind of lean more towards dog man i don't think guys are actually changing the werewolves out there yeah. i mean is there really a, a a politically correct way to say it <laughs> <laughs> which do they prefer yeah <laughs> Um, I've had a couple people that have seen like flying cryptids. I don't know if it's a Mothman or a similar type of creature, a Thunderbird, things like that. Oh. Uh, really cool story from a guy that was uh, solo camping, I think in, uh, I think in Illinois or Indiana. I can't remember now which, but he saw like this weird, like kind of like human esque, like albino creature that like crawled past his campsite at night. A uh, really creepy story. That was really interesting. I have never heard of anybody that had seen anything like that one before. But uh, that's where my interests go. You know, what else might be out there outside of the, you know, the big, the big ones outside of you know Bigfoot, Mothman, Chupacabra. I did have one Chupacabra report. Um, I don't get a lot of reports from like the Southwest and South though, so I don't know about that. I've never had anything about like Lizard Man in South Carolina. Um, lots and lots of Bigfoot sightings. So. <laughs> Oh man, you gotta come to Colorado. We have a UFO watchtower down in yeah down in the uh, Four Corners area. It's really sort of cool too. Oh wow, I've been there. Oh, cool. how yeah. tall is it? How tall? Oh, I don't know, fifty feet. Oh wow! Oh, yeah, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not good. Much past out 10. there all night. <laughs> and, well, people camp there all night, and they they claim to see UFOs all the time. It's it's an interesting area. <laughs> all right. Well, now the thing I want to know: doing these hundred plus interviews with different people, did you encounter any where you walked away shaking your head, going, "You are so full of shit"? Pretty obvious to see through, and I've had some people that I feel like they 100% believe it, but it's the bounds of credibility so far, it's hard for me to buy into it. But you know, I don't want I never want to totally discount somebody because you never know they had the experience, I didn't. But there's definitely some cases where it leaves me kind of wondering if they're all together there. <laughs> yeah, 
that's that that's one thing that I've learned in the paranormal environments is you gotta kind of keep an open mind, but also a sense of skepticism. Uh I'm a I'm a believer, I'm a believing skeptic. I do believe in the paranormal, but I don't think that everything that happens right. you know, mm-hmm. is is paranormal. Oh, the piece yeah. of paper fell off the counter. Oh no, it's a ghost. <laughs> you know, I, I'm not yeah. one of those people, but I have some paranormal stuff, so I know it's true. It's just, you know, you gotta keep a little sense of skepticism uh at it, you know, when it comes to that. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah. No, uh, Benjamin Dan has some questions for Tony yes. here about the uh, Life of the Dead series. Uh, what sparked the idea? What did you know? When did oh, you when? Know the yep. series? And how did you assemble the characters? And what was the hardest part of writing the series? And he just he just did the show for us. There we go. Good job, Ben. <laughs> <laughs> Well, the uh, Life of Dead series was actually my first uh, attempt at like fiction. Um, I drew some short stories, but my first long form fiction, anyway. Um, the first book in the series is called Hell on Earth, and I wrote that in, I guess I started in probably 20, 2015, uh, finished up in early 2016, then started the rewriting process. I've always loved zombie stuff, but more of the uh, Romero uh, zombies than The Walking Dead. I enjoyed the first season or two of The Walking Dead. I got burned out on it. Same. But I yeah. love like George Romero stuff. Like I honestly think Day of the Dead is my favorite zombie movie of all time. I just mm-hmm. love kind of like the mm-hmm. atmosphere in it where it's completely hopeless. And uh, I know a lot of like when I started writing, I didn't really know what tropes were. I didn't know that was a big thing. You're supposed to hit these certain beats to keep readers interested or to hit their. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I just wrote what I wanted to write, uh, which worked out in some ways. In some ways, it didn't. I had a lot of complaints. That I had too many characters. Because, like I said, it was my first attempt at long fiction novel. And if an idea came to me, it was like, oh, this person sounds cool. I just wrote him into the book. So I think I ended up with like 11 point of view characters. Um, and I just kept adding people. <laughs> 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 like, I don't know who this, I can't keep track of everybody. I needed to make notes to follow who this person was. But the books still sell pretty well. So, I mean, it worked out good for me. But uh, I just wanted to do you know, my take on this end of the world zombie apocalypse where. There really wasn't any hope. You weren't going to find this miracle cure that was going to turn everything around and save everybody. I just kind of wanted to follow the last days of humanity and this ragtag group of survivors as they lived and died and hooked up and broke apart, you know, traveled the world. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, Dan also had followed that up with, let me go. What was the hardest part of writing that series? Probably the hardest part, I had my beginning it figured out when I started. I had my ending figured out. <clears throat> when I got to the midpoint, I got lost. Uh, like, I had to put the series in and start the It took almost a year to get the third book out. I was killing it on Amazon still. I'd lost all the momentum. I mean, books three fell like off a cliff. I mean, it was like the biggest mistake in my writing career, probably. Like, I would have kept at it. And been a little stand out ahead of time, I probably would be doing, you know, would have been doing better at that time than I did. But uh, I lost all the momentum I wrote up on Amazon. I felt like I was starting over when book three came out. And so, the hardest part was figuring out, you know, all these characters I had created were kind of converging in book three, making it happen realistically. Uh, you know, how do you have this? virus that wipes out 99.99% of the population. You still have people run into each other by half a step. Uh, you want to keep it as grounded as possible. Uh, but uh, trying to keep make sense of everything and still keep it compelling, I guess, was probably the hardest aspect. Especially around that midpoint. Oops, somebody got a jingle bell. Somebody bring a Christmas in before Thanksgiving. We have a rule about that on this show. <laughs> do not do that. Does not happen. Better on keep this your show. eye in your pocket. We don't want that right now. Mm-mm. No, sir. <laughs> oh, it's happening now. I like to, be, I like to break the rules. It's happening now. <laughs> Dagnabbit. I knew it was a bad idea bringing her on the show, Kristen Vincent. <laughs> <laughs> Next Sunday, full Christmas outfit. 
watch. <laughs> I'll go online and I will get me a damn Amazon special turkey outfit. <laughs> uh, Pat's, ready. Pat's ready to raise the Christmas tree up like right now. So we I'm know what be- kind of Christmas tree you're talking about, so stop. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so many people that has already put their Christmas tree up and decorated it. It's insane. Oh, it's happening now because Jack doesn't say I can't. <laughs> I'm gonna hide. I'm gonna, I'm gonna make my wife work for it. So funny. Um like some of the others, I have not read any of your books. Um but I love zombie books. I love paranormal stuff. Uh, for someone who has not read your work, where would you recommend we start at? I say it mostly uh, depends on what your main interests are. Uh, like my zombie books, are, I think any zombie fan I think would like them. They're very gory. Um, I, I love gory. Hey, that's good. Uh, so, so when I was writing them, my goal was kind of trying to figure out the grossest things I could do with those zombies. Um, so it gets a little intense in places. So if somebody's kind of easily grossed out, probably stick with the more paranormal stuff. It's a little more, you know, genteel, middle-of-the-road horror that I think anybody can read and not, you know, be offended by. <laughs> well, this, this, this crew right here don't get grossed out. Well, no, no. at least not at zombie horror. There are things out there that angel knows about yeah mm-hmm. yeah it's some really fun weeds there i don't get offended i i do get grossed out but i think that's just like the fun of it well, yeah. so I, can... I mean i remember i was oh my god i don't know 18 and my brother and my sister and my dad we were watching one of the saw movies and eating spaghetti. <laughs> yeah. That's hardcore. And, and I think it may have been like the second or the third one because people were saying like the first 15 to 20 minutes of that particular movie was just crucial. And they're like, if you can make it through the first like 15, 20 minutes of the movie, then you can make it the rest of the way. So we're like, oh, well, okay, well, we're going to make spaghetti and you know oh man yeah <laughs> I, I can do blood guts and gore that doesn't bother me but gross like some of the stuff that comes out in the splatter punk stuff i just i, I can't do it just yeah, my I, I don't know. Yeah. This, yeah i want to well, i want a story not a shock factor I, it's i'm, I'm yeah. worried when it comes to reading no <laughs> i don't think so i agree with that I'm Chapter home. ten of Meryl David's Fester. That's yeah. all I got back say. here on the wall. <laughs> mm-hmm. And that oh, one's Tony. actually not hanging there as tribute. That one's actually hanging there because it's like on a rest. It's locked up. <laughs> Stay in it, there. It needs to be quarantined. It's <laughs> filth. Tony, but it's do you great. have any of your books um, on Audible? Yeah, uh, pretty much all of my books are on Audible. Um, the latest, uh, Beware of the Woods, is finished. We're waiting for it to be approved. And Paranormal Pennsylvania hasn't been recorded yet. But uh, I think just about everything else has, yeah. Okay, uh, I got a caveat to that then. So out of all your cryptid books, which one would be a good one to start at for someone who's looking into getting into the whole cri- uh, paranormal <laughs> investigation stuff? Uh, I'd probably go with... Uh, most likely Beware of the Woods, um, because it covers the whole of the uh, North America. The mm-hmm. other ones have uh, one centered in New England, but the other ones are Pennsylvania-based. So if people aren't from PA, they might not find them quite as interesting. Um, I don't think it's a big deal, but, you know, a lot of people like to pick up those books and try to find those locations themselves. Mm-hmm. But, uh, you know, I think we have three different oh, states, I think 20, 22 or 23 different states and territories. And it runs the gamut. We have everything from cryptids to UFO sightings to uh, a couple ghost stories, even in that one, too. So it's got a little bit of something for everybody. Okay, cool. Yeah, I'll definitely be checking out checking out the Beware of the Woods, at least. So. Yeah. Well, now, me and Richard, we've been talking about doing a comedic, don't take it seriously, podcast, um, video out in the field, doing investigations that go fantastically and um 
if we get that going and it's like up and running whatnot, if we can find a way and get into your area or you can get into ours, why don't you come on and do one with us? That sounds great to me, absolutely. But wait to tell you what how the episodes go. You might think twice. <laughs> <laughs> Every oh, episode, be, Jack gets hurt. <laughs> I get hurt a lot. Yeah, no fireworks in these in these episodes. <laughs> no, yeah, that, no that's a whole <laughs> different story, right oh, there. Oh yeah. Mm-hmm. So Tony, uh, what are you working on right now? What's what book are you working on now? Uh, we have a new uh, paranormal, like a sequel to uh, that I'm working on right now. Um, I have uh, all the interviews finished for it. It's just down to the point where I need to condense them and kind of you know take out all the repetitive information from the interviews, stuff like that. Hopefully that'll be out before Christmas. And I also have work on a, I just barely started outlining a new uh, like crime thriller series. Uh, I like to write a little bit of everything. That's the problem for me as a writer. I kind of genre hop too much. Um, I know that hurts you with the Amazon algorithms, but it's the way my mind works. So um, it's kind mm-hmm. of like between uh, Millennium and Three Detective. And I'm working on that right now, but that's just in the outlining stages. Well, now, do you ever think about like, going with different pen names to you know to actually break them apart so that they don't mess with the algorithm so they kind of stand uh-huh. alone yes right now everything's still fragmented i don't know if it's even worth the trouble um for this new series if it comes to fruition i might I do it under a pen name just so i don't have all the baggage of my horror novels and my zombie novels and my turn mm-hmm. yeah readers aren't into that stuff at all so it, it's an idea it's an idea yeah I mean, it's funny how that kind of works. Just have just, just the name alone and what gets attached to it and how it can affect things. Uh, originally, when this show started, it was called Written Undead because it was for the group Written Undead. And that's we talked to a lot of zombie authors, and that was like the main focus of it. But as time went along, we started bringing different authors in and different genres and different things because we have other interests as well. Mm-hmm. And we would reach out to an author that didn't write zombie and would be like, Hey, you want to come on a show? We'd love to have you on, man. Dig what you got going on. And they'd be like, well, I don't do zombie stuff. So I, I'm going to have to decline. It's like, wait a minute, this ain't going to work. So we literally changed our name. And then all of a sudden it was like the floodgates oh. opened and now we can talk to everybody and it's liberating. Trust me. It's liberating to be able to talk yes. about anything and everything. We literally had a spicy dicey romance, steamy yep. <laughs> writer on here not too long ago <laughs> trust me there was a lot of sweat on the brows of plenty of men on this show that day oh yeah mm-hmm. oh yeah, come on about guys that. with what you guys say anyway how could you have ever been embarrassed <laughs> you ain't wrong there buddy dag nabbit oh, oh, you done got ratted what? out it's different oh, it's I different when i'm on this show and make a hooker blush it's different when a woman writes it though i'd re- <laughs> much rather read you know smutty stuff written by a woman than by a man that's just mm-hmm. yeah well, that's true that's, that's true yeah Women romanticize it. We, we don't. <laughs> yeah, we, yeah. Uh, Get straight to the point. point. Yeah. In and out, repeat if necessary. The end. We're done. <laughs> <laughs> ah, damn. That's because women think different. We we want the kink and the fun and the, the stuff. Men just want to hit it and be done. Go to sleep. <laughs> you mean slam bam? Thank you, ma'am. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Mm hmm. So yeah. Jeff, Jeff's influencing everything. I can feel Jeff yes. in the room right now. He's got the wheels flying off the screen at this point. It's like, yeah, it's going it's off the wheels. <laughs> totally losing control. So now, Tony, let me ask you something, man. I'm going to stick with the vein of what we were just going with there. I'm going to piggyback as Angel and Javin like to constantly compete to do in the Written Undead uh, group. Um, have you ever thought about writing in a genre that is – kind of out of your element but you have a fascination honestly not really um i have so many ideas for like horror and thriller stuff that uh that pretty much monopolized my time i haven't really thought of you know venturing out into like sci-fi or anything like that or erotic or anything like that um i'm a horror kid at heart i always have been um like i have one uh thriller series i write with uh, a gentleman named drew strickland that uh, it's kind of like a female private investigator series and like that's like we thought we were hitting the marks for it but 
my horror instincts kind of kick in too much sometimes. Like descriptive. I think that kind of hurt our series a little bit. Um, so I'm trying to like when we do like the thriller stuff, I'm trying to dial it back a little bit. Um, so I think if I would try to venture out at anything pretty far removed from horror, it's really hard for me to dial it back enough to really find any stuff. Okay. All right. Well, now let me ask you. When you're in the writing process, you're in the zone, you're locked in, you're hammering away, and you're going, do you ever catch yourself repeatedly using the same word when there's <laughs> so many other words? I know where this is going. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm pretty incredulous about it myself. But, yeah. 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 Very incredulous on. about it. You, Jack. Very, very, very incredulous <laughs> about it. Catching that eagle, you know. <laughs> but 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 serious on a serious note, have you called yourself even if it's like not so much the same word, but like a catchphrase or um a way of saying like you know one of the things I use is man I'm I'm as nervous as a long tailed cat in a room full of rocking chairs, <laughs> you know. But do you catch yourself like reusing things and you're like stop that and having to go back and redo it? <laughs> I know the pain. Yeah, yeah, I definitely find you know certain turns of phrase that I come back to again and again. It's like kind of like the inside or like the like the Stephen King stuff about every guy wears, you know, blue chambray work shirt. You know, I think I think we all have those little ticks that we kind of fall back on. So you feel better, Rich? Yeah, I feel better now. Thank you. Okay, good. good. <laughs> <laughs> we do a show, we entertain, and we give therapy. It just it works out all the way around. <laughs> all the way around. <laughs> so, man, obviously the answer might be the writing, so that cannot be your answer. What are your least favorite things about writing and your most favorite thing about writing? And the writing can't be the answer. <laughs> I hate marketing. I hate Facebook book ads, Amazon ads. I hate trying to figure out all that stuff out. Yes. That's easily my least favorite part of it. Yeah. The paint is real. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And your most favorite part? My favorite part. Okay, real quick, I want to pause. I'm going to pause the show. Somebody's driving a nail through a wall. And <laughs> That's okay, Jack. You want to let me in from the waiting room so I can actually be on my computer? Oh, that will work. That might explain why I'm the sorry. weird things are going on. Where are you? Oh, I'm ah. sorry. I got it. I just admitted her. Okay, good, good, good. Sorry good. about that. I was like, damn, somebody's hanging a picture frame right in the middle of the, the show here. What's going on? <laughs> it wouldn't be the show if something crazy didn't happen. Of course, it usually happens at the very beginning of it. There she comes. Oh, and she even got her... Oh, there she went. <laughs> okay. I don't... All righty then. Well, uh, hey, Rich, you want to remove the other one, or is is it going to affect? I don't think it will. Either way, oh, let's no, just I'm get on with the thing. other one. I, okay, I, well, I left. All right, well, I'm let's lying. go on from here. All right, Tony, when you aren't writing, what is something that you do to occupy your time that actually makes you happy? I watch movies, hundred <laughs> percent. Um, I, honestly. Like in October, I block off the whole thing. I still write well in October, but I watch as many horror movies as I can. And I do that for all year long, really. But October, I go crazy with it. Uh, weekends, the rest of the year, I watch horror movies. It's honestly my favorite pastime in the world. Uh, aside from that, though, if it's some not like movie related, it would be just taking rides in my Jeep with my dogs, um, hitting back roads, uh, looking for roads I haven't traveled down before trying to find new sites to see um, just clear my mind in nature well because this show is filled with pet lovers what kind of dogs are we talking about I have one <laughs> he's five his name's Jack and I have uh, one that's a complete mystery dog um, part corgi part uh, probably part pit bull um, Heinz 57 definitely <laughs> yeah so Jack's five Ripley's eight or nine-ish. She's a rescue, so I don't really know for sure, but, but yeah, they go everywhere with me. Okay, well, everybody knows that, obviously, without ever knowing me before today, um, 
that you named the first dog Jack after me because who wouldn't? But no, <laughs> seriously, seriously though, where did the names come from? Because Ripley feels like it came from Alien. Yeah, absolutely. Jack feels like it came from The Shining, maybe. Actually, I always say Jack Ireland. Say his name Jack O'Lantern. So that's what oh. I think. Oh. <laughs> Okay, okay, that works. That works. Incorporates my little Halloween. <laughs> Heck yeah. Wait, well, where are they right now? Walk out of the room because Jack would be burping nonstop if he was in here. <laughs> <laughs> over here. Who are these strange people you're talking to, Daddy? Who are these weirdos? Yeah, I'll yeah, bite them. Yeah, right? <laughs> well, at least that last sentence was right. Who are these weirdos? <laughs> uh, let's be honest. So Bobby's trying to get back in. I guess she got booted. Oops. Booted Bobby. the Bobby. All right, Richard, that's on you. You guys to handle that. Now, Angel, you're down there in Puerto Rico. You got the palm yes. trees. You got the, the jungle action going on. You got all that happening. So I'm going to spin off of that and go, have you written anything uh, that's set in a tropical paradise? Tony? No, I haven't. Um, I always kind of fall back on Pennsylvania for my location. So um, I know the spots around here. Um, yeah. and I, like Pennsylvania, where I live, it's fairly remote. Um, I just like kind of that like sparsely populated, um, semi wild terrain. Uh, it just kind of feels fitting for like horror. Um, so yeah, pretty much everything I've written is always stuck around here. Uh, the zombie books they ventured clear out to uh, West Texas, uh, but everything's pretty much West Virginia, Pennsylvania in that ballpark. Yeah, right. What you know, man. Yeah, that's, well, that's what I was about to say. It's, it's, not, the, you, right it's not the woods of ice. It's not the woods of ice out there. I don't know. You got to do a road trip and come down and do Southern Colorado and New Mexico and Nevada. I mean, come on, we've got great paranormal out here. Yeah. What about? So I've heard a lot about uh, the skinwalkers out there. Yeah. We got skinwalkers. We have UFOs all over the place. Um, you know, we have all these government facilities where allegedly they're aliens. Um, and alien spaceships and things like that that you can actually get into nowadays, sort of. <laughs> if you don't mind being arrested and thrown in a federal prison. But you <laughs> Not that Doc's <laughs> ever done that. Not that she's ever done that. Oh, no. You know, I am so straight. I'm always a straight man on your show, so I would never do anything like that. No. <sighs> no. But, um, yeah, there's a lot of good stuff. And then remember, we had the nuclear bombs down here where they tested it. So we have all these weird creatures from the radiation that you guys That's can't really get. Cool. We get some pretty cool stuff floating around. Well, my uh, well, right, Drew Strickland, um, he had a uh, an Airbnb around the site of where Travis Walton was abducted by aliens, actually. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah, Travis Walton, I know that story. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd like to get out there someday for sure. Come visit me. I can do that. <laughs> Heck yeah. I'll take you to some good spots. How many of those do you have, Kristen? Oh, I have six. Oh, my God. <laughs> All right. Well, to catch us up on Dungeon Dan just a little bit here. Um, man, missed everything he said. Had another call come in. Can you start the show over, please? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Then he follows up with... Love the gore and the gross. Makeup effects, bitches, which is what Dan used to do in a previous life. He literally did a lot of the FX that you see in horror movies. He's been there, done that. Again, this is why he hates that he's not here today. So I we're definitely gonna get that. you back. Yeah, we're definitely gonna get you back on again so you and Dan can, you know, spoon or something, like whatever he's looking for here. <laughs> so he said, um, who the hell is behind Doc? Oh, um, this is, a, this is an Aboriginal bloke and his grandchild um, that I photographed about 10 years ago in Australia. And I can oh, give you their Aboriginal names, but they're like 20 syllables long. Holy uh, smokes. Yeah, that, that, that would probably twist my brain. Yep. And then he's, um, and yeah, that was the Actually, end of Dungeon Den. there's nobody behind me, and that must be paranormal. You're seeing ghosts. Yes, <laughs> they're just floating. Uh, there. Of other countries, have you, have you, Tony, um, 
gone to other countries to research uh, paranormal? Unfortunately, no. Uh, I only have passport. I've never been out of the states. So. <laughs> yeah, like I've always wanted to go to Ireland or Scotland. Like yeah. I'm drawn to that place, and I've never been. It's like I have something that wants to go. <laughs> I can send you some to some great castles in um, Scotland, where you'll probably wind up seeing ghosts. Oh, I saw cool. on there, so I'm sure. Yeah, but that was last year, wasn't it? It's my bucket list. Yeah, well, if you go to Ireland, I can promise you they're going to do research on you. You're not going to get to kiss the Blarney Stone because they know you're going to try to steal it. So I wouldn't want to kiss off the, the Blarney list. Stone. You know they piss on piss the Blarney Stone. stone. I was going to yeah. say, you know, when people pissed on that thing. Yeah. yeah. So Tony, well, I got another question for you, my friend. What what would you consider your favorite book that you've written? What was your favorite Ooh. one to write? I think my favorite book, I mean, it's really hard to narrow it down, but I think my favorite is mm -hmm. a novel that I wrote called Within the Woods. Um, <laughs> it uh, captures a lot of my childhood, obviously, you know, fictionalized version of it, but a lot of my friends are in there. Uh, it's kind of like a Invasion of the Body Snatchers meets Night of the Creeps novel. Really fun, really, I mean, more lightweight, I would say, not real serious. Um, but uh, this kind of it's like my homage to those '80s horror movies I grew up watching, Night of the Creeps, Slither. Well, Slither is about '80s, but you know what I mean. Oh, uh, Slither was just nasty. Oh, what a show! <laughs> mm -hmm. That's probably my favorite book. I would have to say is Within the Woods. Cool. Also, well, I think I know where I'm going to start. That one's on Audible. Yes. You did, yeah. Cool. That is where I'm going to start then because, yeah, if that's the, what your favorite one to have written, then I'm going to go with that because I was going to follow up with this question. Have you written anything that is now published? It's out there, probably even on Audible. But after you got through the initial beginning idea and you're having fun and you're writing, all of a sudden you just got aggravated with the damn thing and you're like, I'm going to finish you, you bastard. And you finished it. You got it done. People liked it, but you're just like, Brr. have you had one like that? Not so much. Um, Lucky I've had, bastard. I've had something I've done finishing that uh, just kind of fell apart towards the end. That uh, I've never seen the light of day. I maybe come back to him someday, but but nothing's actually made out into the wild. <laughs> <laughs> Shit, maybe a lesson I should learn then. Huh? Damn. <laughs> yeah, I tried my hand at writing actual books and uh, decided that was not my forte, so I stuck to comedy. <laughs> well, and that's another good question. I will bounce off of you there. I mean, you're making it easy for me there, Ant. Um, have you thought about ever having any of your stuff turned into like graphic novels? I have thought. I thought it would be really cool. I just wouldn't even know where to begin because um, I don't know anybody that does that type of artwork. Um, so <laughs> I totally would be up for it if I knew the uh, the resources and the avenues to take, though. Yeah, uh, we could talk, man. I could, I could walk you through it. Um, it was a learning process for me as well. I've never done comic books before, and uh, thanks to the amazing Chris Philbrook, um, he taught me everything I know that I'm uh, that I know about comic books, and I'd be more than happy to share that information with you. Um, it's it, it's fun. There's. there's there's my product uh, of all the hard work. So, I mean, and book two and three are written right now. So, dude, you could totally get your stuff. Uh, and I've, I've thought this with uh, with Chris Philbrook stuff, and he's talked about cost and whatnot. And yet, Anthony's over here doing it. Um, thought about it with Mark Tufo with the zombie Fallout series, or hell, oh, Indian Hill, man, to get Drabebon, the big alligator looking character you know fighting mike it's like it just feels like a natural progression to me and so i just keep throwing it out there like hey holler at a comic book artist man see what you can work out get it's, it turned into something else i think the hardest part about doing comic book uh graphic novel work is finding an artist that's dedicated enough to the project to uh you know especially if you're doing like a series like me um, to stay on for the whole series 
and and have the mm -hmm. army consistent. Um, and also you have to think about cost per page, uh, you know, because um, the artists that I got right now uh, originally wanted to charge me like $400 a page or something like that. And I was like, no, I can't do that. But then once he learned about my situation and the story and everything, now he's doing it for like $100 a page. So, uh, you know, you got to just find the right person. He's so dedicated. He's like, he's like, I don't care how many books you do. I want to do Bad Wabbit. He's my character now, too. And I, so, you know, I was like, great. That's awesome. So we got 19 books to go, and uh, it's going to be an awesome series. So, yeah, that's what I'm saying, dude. I, it's basically like your paranormal stuff. Like he said about the pages and, you know, the cost. Man, start with one of the shorter ones early. Oh, yeah. You know, and just kind of get that out there and see how, you know, kind of like a fisherman, throw that line out, kind of crank, wait. Oh, got a bite. and see how it I, goes. I always thought it would be really cool to have, like, uh, an anthology comic book based either on true stories or even just kind of written originals uh based on like paranormal stuff ghosts and stuff like that um i had been talking around the idea for something called like pk kids or something like that and have like a group of kids like in the 80s back in the day you know, sort of stranger things kind of thing but they're like paranormal investigators and i've been tossing that around for the last couple of weeks because i'm sick playing in bed like what am i gonna do with myself? <laughs> whiner <laughs> yeah I mean, uh, it's possible. Mm -hmm. yeah. So Tony, uh, I got a, I kind of got a, another question for you. More of a marketing question. Have you looked into Kickstarter? I never have. Um, it's, so, it's something that I, I, I know a lot of people have success with it. It's something I just never really considered for myself. All right. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm the same way. I'm just, I'm just asking because you know people told me that I should do a Kickstarter. So, just wondering. Kickstarter is a very good place to go to raise funds, but you're not going to make any money off of it. Like I, yeah, it's exactly what he said. It's a good, it's a good thing to get you started and get you because if it wasn't for Kickstarter, Bad Wabbit number one would have never been published and out there the way it is. But I haven't made any money off of it. But people know it. They, you know, oh, it's on the wall. Exposed. Exposure. But, yeah, it's to get you exposure, you know, and you know now it's in five different stores, and I'm working on two. And uh, again, book signings and stuff. So people are getting it, but that's what Kickstarter does for you. It gives you the money to distribute it and get it in people's hands. And uh, I mean, if you have the money to uh, put into your Kickstarter, you might be able to make a little bit of profit, but you're going to have to put some money in there too, you know? Okay. But yeah, like I said, I, I totally endorse it. Hell, I'm. Did my tear, you know, with Anthony's to get that thing going. Got a kick-ass hoodie out of it, by the way. Oh yeah. <laughs> plus, plus the cool comic. And yeah, t -shirt. Yep. That is yeah, I love the T-shirt. When I well, since we're doing this, do you have merch, man? No, I don't. Uh, <laughs> um, it's something I've, I, I, I just really kind of created uh, like a website probably two years ago, and I just don't like sign paperbacks. I feel like I'm not like you know, like I don't know. I just feel like I don't have the following that would warrant you know teacher or you know work. Maybe I would. I don't know. Um, but I just kind of feel like small potatoes. <laughs> well, now I see what like what uh, Mark Tufo does is he will set up a thing. I don't know how it works exactly, but he sets up a thing with like Teespring to where if he gets X number of orders, then he will send the order in and get the t-shirts made and send them out. And he, you know, he doesn't lose anything in it. You know, he winds up collecting his, his part of it and he goes there, but it is based entirely on, do you get enough orders? Yeah. Hell, maybe try that. Cause dude, I said, I'm all about rocking author merch, like this book cover on my chest right now. Like this is what I walk around in. Yeah. And, dude, I would totally rock your merch, and I'm definitely gonna be checking out your books. There's no choice about that. Yeah, I'll give it some fun. I appreciate it. I, I personally, would, if you do, I would personally use Printify. Um, they're extremely uh, punctual with the delivery. <laughs> Um, because I used teaching for the longest time and it was very hit or miss. 
uh, with delivery. Uh, I I sent uh, Chris Philbrook uh, a couple of shirts and a hoodie uh, for his birthday, and he didn't get it for like a year. <laughs> oh. So Damn. it was like, what? I mean, it could have been a mess up at the post office, but either way, it, it was a constant thing with Teespring. So I just kind of went to Printify and closed that out. Right on, right on, right on. Well, guys, we are down to the final wow. nine minutes now of this thing. It went by quick, did it? Just in there hanging out, just BSing around, you know, getting to talk to Tony, mm -hmm. doing our thing. Yes. As I've always described the show, it's a group of friends hanging out at the bar, getting to meet the new friend and the crew, yep. learning about them, and just being our goofy selves. So, Tony, while we still got you here for a little bit longer... Do you have any like big time plans for the future for any kind of new series that you'd like to tell everybody about? Uh, I mean, the uh, thriller series I mentioned, but that's still in its infancy. Um, I get so many ideas that never come to fruition. Could easily be one of them. Uh, I have uh, like I started a Halloween horror novel. Um, I was hoping to have after Halloween. Didn't even get close to finishing that. So um, that's on the back burner for now. Uh, my paranormal books have been going so well. I've also put a lot of time into those lately. Um, I mean, I figure I may as well go where the market's hot right now. And uh, so, like I said, another Blur of the Woods book will be coming up before the end of the year. And uh, I have interviews started for another kind of like a spinoff of Blur of the Woods. Um, so, yeah, I mean, just, uh, you know, my paranormal stuff, I guess, would be my biggest, uh, you know, work in progress with Fantastic. All right, back to Dungeon Dan. Tony, is the Life of the Dead available as a package deal on Audible? It is. Um, and the reason for that is I have a different narrator for book one than for books two through five. So we can't do a bundle because of that. Um, the guy who narrated two through five has offered to re-record book one, but I feel... I feel like that would be kind of like screwing over the guy who recorded book one, who did a great job, but just didn't work out schedule to help him do the rest of the series. I feel like it would, because book one still is pretty good on Audible. I feel like it would really compare to him take the royalties um, for the work that he did to do a bundle with the other narrator. So, um, so we're kind of in limbo on that. Okay. Okay. Are you happy, Dan? You're on the show, Ding Dong. <laughs> yep. Mr. I'm on call. Yeah, he's he's on call. All right, he's probably three sheets and you know, yeah, into a bowl there. Yeah. Probably like a snake in a ball. Yep, totally just neck deep in some cheesecake. He's BS, and I know he is at that gum dungeon, Dan. Yeah, he, he says yes. It, 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 it was it, it, it was stage fright is what it was. He was too scared to come on to be with one of his favorite authors, but okay, Dan, it's fine. We won't call you out in public in front yeah, of everybody. Totally mean, he's, uh, Dungeon Dan says he's on Pornhub, so... You know, he's, he's <laughs> See, he's busy. He's got things to do. Yes. Uh -huh. So, man, man I, I, one of the last questions I really want to ask you, because I'm piddling with this writing thing, and Doc... The beautiful woman right there is like trudging through the crap that I've sent to her to pour through and just try to save me from myself. Um, when you first you use an editor, I assume, first off, let me go ahead. Okay, so the first time you ever sent something to an editor, very first time, and they sent that sucker back to you. <laughs> what first off, what did you see, and then second off. How did it make you feel? Oh, it was brutal. <laughs> it was <crazy. laughs> Yeah, I don't mind, like how much I realized you need to cut like 20% of it. It's just like so crushing. <laughs> so, now, yeah, did, you, did you have the moment where you went, no, but I need that. It needs to be in there. <laughs> yeah, a lot, of, a lot of moments where I'm like, really have to take this you know whole chapter out of two weeks writing yeah that happens a lot <laughs> oh my god whole chapters oh geez thank d or i mean i, I was shit doc because there's a dj cooper who also does some editing and she can be a little brutal in her own right when she wants to be but so doc please don't kill me on an entire chapter i swear to god no i just tend to 
you know, beef this up or beef that up or add this in or add that up so far. Yeah, thanks to her, since we're talking about editors at the moment, um, I added a part in a chapter basically giving you the history of Adirondack chairs that these guys are about to sit down in. <laughs> I managed to work that in thanks to her. So, But now, have you had your editor at any point throw something at you and you went, damn, light bulb? Like, why didn't I think of that? Uh, I mean, mostly in terms of like condensing or like I said, removing things. Because I get so in love with the characters I write that I just want to delve so deep into who they are and their lives that I'll write, like I said, scenes that are just completely extraneous. That you know, they go in the extended disc, the extended on the DVD would be great for the movie, but they wouldn't make the theatrical cut. Right. So that's where an editor comes in most handy for me is saying, hey, you know, this might be good writing, but it doesn't advance the plot or it doesn't build on the character. Or in a meaningful enough way to keep the reader invested. So, yeah. And I don't overwrite as much as I used to, and I do give, give credit to the editors uh, trying to, like, you know, knocking me back a little bit, saying, hey, we don't need to know all the minutiae of their day or their lives. And, you know, I, stuff I find interesting might not necessarily interest the average reader who's trying to, you know, knock out their fifth book of the week. Yeah, well, they're they're trying to get to the blood, guts, and gore. Yeah, that's so, one of the quickest it, ways to lose me in anything there. is when you over describe something or you go too far into detail. I mean, I want detail, but I don't want to know that there's a crumb on the floor in the corner of the room, and you know, it's like it's, it's like, come on, get to the good stuff. That's Stephen King for you. Sometimes. <laughs> Yep, go ahead, throw the man's name out there. It's fine. Chuck him out there, Angel. Oh, I'm under mm -hmm. that bus. Oh, boy. We're going to catch hell now. Lightning bolts for everyone. <laughs> oh. I mean, I was lucky enough to get Chris to edit, uh, Chris Philbrook to edit Bad Wabbit. Uh, it was originally uh, one book, and he was very kind and didn't rip my head off and uh, suggested that we split the book in two, and now we have, you know, all that ready. all these but, books yeah but i mean editors are great and it just i guess it depends on how they go about telling you your stuff sucks <laughs> all right well before we get to the big wrap-up of the show i'm going to ask you the most obvious question in the world at least i assume it is we'll see what you say but you as an established published doing well author for someone who has never written but wants to what would be your suggestion to them to be a writer? Read a lot. Read everything you can read. Um, I think that's what got, I think that's what gave me a little bit of a head start as a writer. Um, I've been a voracious reader since I was in elementary school. I started reading Stephen King when I was in, I think, fifth grade. Um, and I just read everything I could, and I still do. I just love reading. I think just reading books kind of gives you helps you figure out a sense of storytelling. I'm not saying to copy anybody that you read, but it kind of, you know, shows you how books differ from movies and how getting inside a character's head is something you do in a book that you can't accomplish in a film. So I think the more you read, the better writer you're going to be. Yeah. Okay, that's actually the not the answer I expected because usually the answer we get is, well, just write it. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and so, but that makes sense because uh, Jeff Thompson, RIP, God, I miss that guy. He used to tell us all the time watch all the horror movies you can watch, read all the horror stuff you can write. If you want to write horror, if that's your thing, do the research. And the research is actually really fun. Yeah. Go watch the movies, go read the books, listen to the audiobooks, do all of that. And that will help you grow as a writer and. I mean, first off, do you agree with that sentiment? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yep. 100%. And yeah, uh, when Freddie took off for me, I have a friend who loves horror movies. And he's like, hey, I want to give this a try. And he wrote like two chapters. Well, I think he wrote a whole novel. And he gave me the first two chapters to read. And he's never read a book in his adult life. And it showed. I mean, I felt bad critiquing his stuff, but I mean, it was just everything was very on the nose. I mean, you could tell it just it read like a book written by somebody who doesn't read books. Right. And that's why I think writing and or I think reading is such an important aspect of writing. It gives you that foundation. It gives you the uh, 
you know, storytelling isn't innate for everybody. It doesn't come naturally for everybody. But if you read a lot, you at least kind of hear those beats. You can kind of see how things come together in those books. And it gives you a big head start as far as I'm concerned. Hell yeah, dude. Totally agree. 100% on board with that because you see words that you've heard them before, but you don't know what they look like. You don't know what they're spelled like. You can learn so much by physically seeing the words. Now, something I suggest to everybody is if you get a book from an author, get both the audiobook and the ebook. Have two devices, one listen to the audio while you look at your Kindle or your Goodreads or whatever it is you're using and watch the screen see the words and it's it's just an amazing thing well guys damn it once again we have reached the end of another book asylum podcast that means all the inmates are going to get their uh medications on time hopefully dungeon dan is on call so i make no promises because he's the he's the nurse that doles them out um so for anthony Bad Webbit Castro, Richard Ryan Rose, Doc Freed, please go easy on me, Kristen Vincent, poet extraordinaire, Angel Ramon, and Tony Urban. We're going to start the roundabout. Angel, where can everybody find you, dude? You can find me on Amazon. You can find me here on, on uh, every Saturday hanging out with these these magnificent bastards and all that. <laughs> yes, Jack. Yes. And you can also find me on Facebook in the Witten Undead, the Book Assignment Podcast. And you can also find me on the Zombie Book of the Month Club this month in November. I've taken over that group. So yeah, Mr. Winner. Me. Mr. Winner. <laughs> yep. Thank and uh, by the way, Pina Canaz and Rats 3 will be coming in December. So, so you can go check that out. Awesome stuff, man. All right, Mr. Rose, how is book four coming along in the wild? Uh, so the boys universe, and where can everybody find the first three? Well, you can find the first three on Amazon. You can also go to my website and also my Facebook page, Richard R. Rose Author. Uh, book four, I've got the prologue done. I've been in job search hell for the past few months so i've been focusing on getting a job so i can afford to start writing again so uh <laughs> i've got that handled now so i'll be back at it hard and heavy and hopefully get this thing out early next year well you already know dungeon dan is going to start giving you hell effectively now like, yeah yeah you're pretty much in <laughs> trouble at this point Miss Krista and Vincent, you have got so much crap on your mind right now so many ideas flowing through your head but what do you have going on right now, and where can everybody find you? Yeah, so <clears throat> right now uh, I'm finishing up book three. I'm just really trying to get all of it, like, in the placement and everything where I want it, um, you know, formatted. Uh, you can find me on here on Saturdays. You can also find me on Amazon under K Vincent. Uh, I do have a website through Wix. I will have to pin it in the comments. Um, and yeah, I mean, I'm working on a few novels and some short stories and yeah. Got stuff going on. All righty. Doc, if anybody needs any editing help, if you're actually up to that, can people search you out? Sure. You can find me on uh, Facebook at Doc Free. You can also find me at Doc at Abo Arts for aboriginalarts.com Go ahead. Oh, and for and, and for the record it's uh doc freed is not f-r-e-e-d it's more like fried which i actually called her doc fried the first time i met her which got plenty of laughs i'm so used to being called that it's like whatever <laughs> i wab it what the hell you got going on Oh man, too much. Uh, <laughs> um, well, uh, you guys can find me at bmwcomics.com. Um, and you can find me here on Saturdays most of the time. I have been on hiatus the last uh month or so because I've been, like I said, I got a lot going on. Um, I have book one is out, it's at five local spot shops, about to be in New Hampshire as well. Uh, working on Tennessee. 
Yeah, and Chris Stobrook, if you guys are in the Manchester, New Hampshire area, on uh, the 11th, he's going to be doing a signing for Bad Wabbit um, at uh, Double Midnight Comics there in Manchester. Um, I have a signing on December 1st um, in Austin Books and Comics uh, here in Austin, Texas. And I... That's it, man. We're, just, we're hitting it. We're trying to get it on global, you know? Um, so hit me up, dmwcomics.com. You can get your physical copies and your um, uh, digital copies there. So, Yep, yep. And don't forget, you can also find a shit ton of merch there as well if you, like, look around. Oh, yeah, merch. Oh, also, I'm going to be doing comic, uh, Caster's Comic the Corner again. I'm going to pick that back up. Uh, where I talk to uh, indie comic book creators and uh, promote their books and find out what makes them tick. So keep an eye out for that, too. Sweetness. All right, Mr. Tony Urban, first off, and thank you so much for coming to hang out with this pack of weirdos right here. Because <laughs> we ain't regular people. We ain't right. There's something wrong with us. I mean, hell, look behind me. There's something wrong with us. I mean... We're not right, but thank you so much for coming to hang out, dude. You were awesome to talk to. You seem like just a fantastic guy that I would just love to like nuzzle your neck, but we will <laughs> refrain. We will refrain. But Mr. Urban, where can everybody find you? Well, first, thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. I had a good time talking with everybody. Uh, you can find me on Facebook uh, under Tony Urban. Uh, my website is tonyurbanauthor.com. That's about the extent of it. I don't do much on social media aside from that from Facebook. So, there's the two main things. Well, hi, damn. We're keeping it all centralized in one simple place. It's easy to get to. So, get there. Go check out what this band has going on. Turn him into the next big thing because we need another next big thing because, trust me, I am so sick and tired of the same old thing because that's all we keep getting over and over and over again. It's fresh blood, fresh meat. Fresh gore. Let's get it done. For the crew, I am Jack Childress. This is the Book Asylum Podcast, and we will see you guys. Ooh, wait, I'm torturing Richard right now, just for the record. He always lets me know when it's time to end the show. So I'm going to announce next week's guest as soon as I grab the right book. Again, torturing Richard. <laughs> actually, you know what? <laughs> no, I actually, I go back to work tomorrow. Supposed to be retired, oh, but I'm going oh, back to work. Yeah, yeah you have a have one of those J-O-Bs? Yeah, a, J a, 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 a J-O-B, not a J-O-B, man. There's no way you have one of those. Anyway, nope, I can't find the book right now. So, for everybody on the show, this has been the Book Asylum Podcast. I am Jack Childress. That is Tony Urban. Go get his stuff. We will see you guys next week. Later. <laughs>